Hi, this is Agun Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. And today we have with us Luke Sillenbinder and Jan Wagner from uh, Stadia Maps. First of all, welcome to the show. Uh, when you started the company, what are the problems that you see in the market that you wanted to solve? So Ian and I are both have been software developers for 10 plus years. And we had a mutual client who was using Google Maps and they needed to provide more maps on some of their services and they were looking at the costs and it was simply too much to be able to do this um, this offering that they wanted to do, this product they wanted to build. So we started looking at alternatives and didn't really find any that met our client's need. So at that point, we then looked into the possibility of building it ourselves. And after probably about two or three months of research, we realized not only is this a good thing to do for our client, but this could be a really good product to offer. So we took about six months and built the initial version of the product for the client. And shortly thereafter, we launched publicly. What exactly is Stadia Maps? We are basically a location data company. What we offer primarily is map tiles. That's for online um, websites and for mobile applications. If you want to put a map, embed a map in that, and then you can take your, your location data. So for instance, where your stores are located and put that on top of the map. And then additionally, we offer um, other geographic data services such as routing and navigation and fun things like time zones. When you talk about, you know, map tiles, do you like acquire it from other companies? Do you build it yourself? Uh, how does that work? A few years ago, if you would have asked anyone uh, whether a bunch of random people on the internet could make the world's best encyclopedia, then they would have uh, laughed you out of the room. Well, that's exactly what happened with Wikipedia, and that's also the same thing that happened with OpenStreetMap, uh, which both of us are involved in. So OpenStreetMap is our primary data source. Uh, there are a few others as well, but OpenStreetMap is the primary data source, and we're really passionate about that and open data. And we think that more pe the more people that come together and use this, the more companies that are built around this, then the better the data is going to get. So yeah, Google does have some unique advantages sending cars all over the place. But like when they put in a new street that's one way or something next to my house, then that takes, um, you know, six months to a year to show up on Google and Apple. So um, answer your question, it's the power of the crowds. You're basically commercializing OpenStreetMap, if I'm not wrong. You know, the first time that you hear about OpenStreetMap, you go to OpenStreetMap.org or whatever, and you're like, oh my word, what is this? This, this is like giving me a headache. You know, there's just so much detail there. So um, that's actually part of the value that we bring is being able to condense this massive amount of data into something that's actually usable. How do you kind of differentiate yourselves? What value you add on top of OpenStreetMaps while also remaining part of the OpenStreetMap community? Primarily OpenStreetMap, um, their services that would, that would uh, match ours are not for commercial use. So the, the process of turning map data into a usable map online is actually quite complicated and quite resource intensive when it comes to compute power and things like that. So OpenStreetMap, the project, the foundation is not in the business of offering commercial maps. So what we take is their data and add the ability for a commercial product, a, a company to use that data on their website. Um, without us, the OpenStreetMap servers would be overloaded. And if you follow their, their Twitter, you see frequent messages from their ops team saying, We're, our tile servers are overloaded because people are using them that probably shouldn't be. So we offer the ability to use that data on your website without um, infringing on their ability to deliver the open source side of things. And, and what kind of custom uh, either services or features uh, that you're offering to your customers. Can you talk a bit about that on top of OpenStreetMaps? OpenStreetMap could be thought of in, well, the, there's a huge debate in the community, but one way that OpenStreetMap likes to think of itself is it's a gigantic database. And a database by itself is only so useful as far as end users go. So in order to go from this gigantic Postgres database to maps that you can use to map out your restaurant locations or track your fleet of trucks or whatever. Um, you, ne you need to have something that converts that into a usable map for for your website. So that's, that's the core thing that we do. And for instance, our routing and navigation engine actually takes the OpenStreetMap data, processes it in a different way, a different way than you would for map tiles, 
and turns that into data that's usable for navigation as opposed to map tiles. How do you differentiate yourselves from Google or Apple? We're actually a business to business company. We are not um, we are not a B2C company. So if you want to use Google Maps on your website, then you used to be able to do this for free for most of the last decade, unless you had some really crazy high volume website like the New York Times or something, then you could use Google Maps for free. That has uh, changed significantly though, and Google is basically only interested in enterprise customers. So price is a really big problem for a lot of these small businesses. And um, you know, looking with the potential economic downturn and things coming up, then we, we think that we're in a really unique position because we really, really care about helping small businesses. That's how we got our start was a smaller client of ours that was using Google Maps for free for so long. It wasn't even like a key part of their website. It wasn't like they're a logistics company or something. It was just this random feature to help uh, help people find the locations of uh, churches in this case. So they wanted to find a place to worship and this was a feature that they had on their site. And they were either gonna have to not offer it anymore or find another solution. So we, we feel pretty strongly about empowering more businesses to use maps because we think that the uses have not been exhausted. They definitely haven't been fully explored. So we wanna, we wanna make it easier for small businesses to do this. And uh, in addition to not gouging you on price, we are, we are human beings and we are, we are really here to give you live support. You're not gonna, get routed to some call center that's just going to give you a script or something like that. Um, you're talking directly to us. We, we really, really care about providing solid support for the businesses that we're working with. Can you give some typical examples of what kind of businesses are using it? Uh, what kind of workloads are there? So we have quite a few fitness websites. So people want to plan their next run, their next bike ride, their next swim. And those websites use this typically for map tiles, so people can can see their route on a map, and then also for routing. So our routing engine supports pedestrian routing and bike routing, which can be used for planning your next run. We also have a lot of real estate. So anytime you want to look at a house or an apartment, you want to know where it is in the city or where it is in context. Um, so we have a lot of real estate companies that use this on their website. Multiple websites in the UK use this for um, campsite. So you can go find the next campsite that you want to either take your RV to or actually go tent camping. And what we have discovered is when we started Stadium Maps, we had a rather narrow idea of the of the um, industries that actually needed maps. We were thinking maybe logistics, maybe travel. And what we've discovered is, yes, those industries really need maps, but there's also a lot of other industries that need maps. For instance, we have a network of funeral homes and they need to, for anyone that wants to go to the funeral, they want to display a map and a route to that funeral home. And the, the examples could go on and on. Uh, this could be a bit of an uncomfortable question, but if you look at open source communities, uh, sometimes they move slower than the corporate entities because you know with corporate entities not only that you have resources i mean open source communities actually have much bigger resources because thousands of people are working there instead of just like team of five in, in engineers uh, they tend to move slowly because you have to make so many compromises there's so much you know back and forth versus you can move in very fast you know if you look at amazon versus kubernetes uh, so when it comes to stadia maps uh, versus open street maps uh, if if you know there is something that a feature that you want hey you know what this is what my users need so uh, what is your policy that you push things to upstream open uh, street map first or you just implement it locally and then try to do so i want to understand first of all the chemistry between the the stadia maps versus open street maps and then at the same time how do you plan to stay competitive so that you can respond quickly instead of having to wait for the whole community do you see it as a conflict or that's how it works in the open street map ecosystem, there are a whole lot of companies operating. And some of them are viewed a little less friendly by the community. Um, I won't name any names, but there are a few there are a few of them that aren't uh, aren't particularly well liked by some people in the community. It's not it's not the majority of the community even. It's a, it's actually a relatively small subset. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's always that dynamic between the people who are like, you know, the, um, you know, almost the Richard Stallman style, like I, I want everything to be free, 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 free. You can't, uh, you can't, uh, build any closed source software. You can't make your own thing. Everything has to be open. Um, so yeah, I get that. Um, but as you said, company is part of the reason why they exist, why they are able to turn a profit is because they can make a decision without having to wait for a broad community consensus when that might not necessarily be forthcoming. So when things like that come up, then yeah, we're not afraid to go and build something internally ourselves. But whenever possible, we also try to let the community know, hey, here's this thing that we're doing, especially if it would involve something like the database. I mean, OpenStreetMap is fundamentally a public database. So we aren't necessarily going to say, oh, let's go and create our own new indoor mapping schema because we don't like the existing one. It sucks. Uh, we're not going to do something like that. But what we might do is say, okay, we figured out that there's this um, there's this uh, thing that we want to add to these indoor maps. So we're going to create our own database for this. And while while there's this interim period, while the community is still trying to come to a consensus, then um, we maintain our own. And but we still are working with the community to get that all upstreamed. Can you tell us a bit about you know what are the core components of uh, Istudio Maps? I do know one component is of course OpenStreetMaps. Yeah, so that's actually one of the things we're most proud of is our infrastructure. Um, so all this starts with OpenStreetMap, um, but there's a, a whole pipeline of processing that happens. And so we import the, we import the data from OpenStreetMap, and then we process that into a database that's usable for map tiles. And then we distribute this database around the world. And then we have a, a global network of servers um, that we're able to run quite quite efficiently and use that to generate the actual map tiles very close to the user when they request them. So one of the things that we do is that is unusual from other providers is we actually render all of this data live. So as opposed to taking the database pre-processing, dumping it into a file and pushing it out to the to the edge, we're actually able to um, pull directly from our central database and as a result make changes very quickly. So if someone reports a problem with the data, we can go in and actually change it in that central database instead of having to change it, regenerate a bunch of files and push it out to the world. And um, additionally, that allows our services to be um, very fast because we do have the global network. And as a result of the, the efforts we put into the infrastructure, um, we've rebuilt a lot of components that we initially found to be slow or just inefficient. Um, we've been able to keep our prices very, very competitive and quite a bit lower, which plays again into our mission of allowing more people to use maps for things that they might not have thought to use maps before. Um, I think especially when it comes to pricing, you look at our competitors and often you think that it's only designed for people who must have maps. And we want to make maps available for businesses that would like to have maps and think it would benefit their customers in a small way, but perhaps in a very meaningful way. We're not afraid to embrace new technologies that uh, other, other companies that are larger might not have necessarily picked up on yet. Uh, one of our favorites at the moment is Rust. It's a uh, it's not new, new, but it's it's only like ten years old or so. It's a systems programming language designed to give you the basically the speed of C, but with the reliability of a more modern, high level programming language. It has a really strong type system and prevents you from doing stupid stuff with memory, but it's also really, really fast. And so we've actually rewritten a lot of our key infrastructure in Rust, and we've open sourced a lot of key components of that as well. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you try to keep it closer to the users. How close is that and how do you achieve it? So we have a global network of edge servers in, um, I believe it's eight data centers right now. Um, we run all of our infrastructure on Linode and um, use quite a bit of their networks features. And then the generation data is on three continents. So we're able to generate tiles in Europe, in the US, and in Asia. Um, and that's that's pretty much the scope of, of the network. 
Um, but a lot of our competitors we've seen use very centralized data centers and then use someone else to actually get the data out to the user. And we discovered very quickly that that doesn't always result in the best re best speed and best reliability for our users. So we took a couple months and built that edge network. By decentralizing both the the edge network that users are talking to, as well as the um, the rendering side of things, taking that raw database, converting it to an image or whatever, by decentralizing both of those, it actually makes the whole thing more resilient. So we've had cases where almost entire data centers have gone down, but users have only noticed a, a slight drop in speed. and. That's what we believe is is necessary to build a, a company that users really rely on. How are you how are you funding the company? Uh, Good question. Uh, we're completely bootstrapped, um, so our bank accounts funded it. Um, we are profitable now, though, so um, that's uh, that's pretty cool. We hit that milestone last year, so um, we we believe strongly in building a sustainable company. Um, we we don't really like the idea of taking in outside investors because that that like that shuffles your priorities up a bit and it uh, distracts you a bit from your vision. So by building something that is sustainable from the ground up, yes, we sacrifice some in terms of we don't have as many marketing dollars or things like that, but it gives it gives us freedom and lets us really stay true to our mission. Uh, Luke, yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for talking to me today. Uh, good luck with your uh, initiative. As you can see behind me, I have a lot of VR and AR stuff, and I would actually be more than happy to see if you could also build something for the VR world where I can navigate using your stadium apps as well, uh, which uh, means, as Ian was saying, that you're not shy of emerging technologies or new technologies, So, which is actually a good you know, change to hear from uh, a company who's using a lot of open source technologies there. Uh, so once again, good luck and thank you for your time.